Greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Williams, the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods or Analysis and Analysis, or CARM, at Wayne State University. And it's September 23rd, 2011. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to another session of Meet the Methodologist. And we are particularly excited today uh, to have this opportunity to chat with Herman McGinnis. Uh, as you may know, Herman is the Dean's Research Professor and Professor of Organizational Behavior and Human Resources at Indiana University, uh, where he is also the Founding Director of the Institute for Global Organizational Effectiveness. And uh, I think this will be uh, Herman's third webcast that he is delivering as part of our webcast program. And uh, Herman has been a regular contributor as well through our short course uh, program and uh, is a great friend. So I'm going to welcome Herman to Motown. Thank you, Larry. Great so uh, uh, Herman, uh, it was fall of 2008 when you last visited Karma. And that was just as your term as editor of organizational research methods was ending. And uh, now that some time has passed, I was wondering, uh, what is it that you think of as you reflect back on that time period? Well, thank you, Larry, uh, for having me back. It's always uh, good to be back here at Karma. Uh, I'd like to start uh, answering that question by reminding the audience that Larry Williams is a founding director of Organizational Research Methods. The journal was launched in 1998 uh, through the vision of Larry. And we have gone a long way since 1998. The latest uh, impact factor for ORM is 4.42. Uh, impact factors are just one metric to look at the quality and the impact of the journal, not the only one. But according to that metric, ORM is number six out of uh, 140 journals in the field of management, and number two out of almost 70 journals in the field of applied psychology. So if you look at that metric and other metrics, RM is certainly one of the most influential uh, journals in the social and behavioral sciences. It takes a village to build a journal. Uh, so being the editor was certainly a fantastic experience for me. But I'd like to thank my team of that time, at that time, Mark Gavin, Bill Vandenberg, Jack Lance, Karen Log, and Dave Kitchen, who were my associate editors, and of course, the board. Uh, it was one of the best times uh, in terms of my career uh, because I just learned so much. Uh, as the editor, you're forced to read uh, papers on topics that are outside of your comfort zone. You just have to read papers that are not part of your main uh, line of research. So it was a great learning experience. Uh, it's fun looking back, remembering the, the good old days, and see how RM has increased its visibility and impact and has become one of the leading journals in the applied uh, social and behavioral sciences. So how do you think uh, being an editor impacted your own research and how you view the work of others? That's, that's funny because I actually I wondered about that myself and being a, a data driven person I actually collected some data on that and uh, colleagues uh, of mine and I published an article in the Academy of Management Learning and Education last year in which we looked at uh, about 50 past editors of leading journals over the last 50 years and we looked at their career trajectories before being editors during the editorial term and after to see what happened to the research productivity after becoming editors. And unfortunately, the news are not that great for some of us who may want to become editors at some point because we found that there's a decrease in the productivity after becoming an editor and it's quite steep. And it takes about 10 years, a whole decade, for these former editors to go back to the level of productivity pre-editorship. And the reason is obvious. Uh, it's a huge amount of work. Being an editor is a huge amount of work. However, we measured productivity only in terms of the number of articles that each person published. Uh, it could be that you publish fewer articles, but better articles, because you become better at understanding what you need to do to make a good contribution to the field. So how that has impacted my, my career, I think I am better able to see 
a good idea early in the process so that I don't realize it was a bad idea after I spent two years on it. Uh, so I think it's been a, a big time saver for me and also for my students. And they're very grateful that I, <laughs> I was editor because I saved them a lot of time by telling them do not pursue that because that may not be a promising avenue. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, you have uh, recently moved to Indiana University and uh, where you started uh, and was the founding director of the Institute for Global Organizational Effectiveness. Uh, I was wondering if you would uh, like to uh, tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a new initiative. Uh, uh, it's an institute that was created because of the needs of universities to get external funding and the needs of uh, industry to improve their human capital. Um, we have a big divide right now between science and practice. And part of that divide is evidenced by the fact that uh, universities need resources that companies could provide but they don't provide. And companies need resources that universities could provide and often do not provide. So what the Institute does is a new model of university industry collaboration. What we do is we receive money from donors. We use that money to train MBA students and doctoral students who work together. And then uh, we also produce knowledge that companies can use, as well as human capital. We train students that eventually are hired by these businesses. Uh, it's a very exciting initiative. We received uh, initially a five million dollar cash gift to launch the Institute. We provide very generous stipends to uh, doctoral students uh, and also uh, tuition waivers to MBA students. So if you or your friends or somebody you know is interested in pursuing a PhD degree management and entrepreneurship or an MBA, please have them talk to me or go to the website for the Institute for Global Organization Effectiveness. Okay. Uh, well, as I mentioned, you switched jobs and uh, many of our viewers are likely to be on the job market or anticipating being on the job market uh, soon, including some for the first time. And I was wondering, uh, given your recent experience, whether you could comment on how this process differs uh, most recently, from the first time you were looking for a job, how it's different for a junior faculty versus a senior faculty member, and any specific advice on this process that you'd like to share? As we all know, the job market is, is really bad uh, if you're looking for a job these days uh, due to the economic situation. So uh, you need to think about what you like to do with your career, what options you have available, and how can you how you can improve the chances of being successful at securing the job that you want. A way to do that is to create a, a list of the things that a university or, or, or company looks for in hiring someone like you, and a list of the things you have to offer. And then you look at what you have to offer and what they want. And you look at the list and Take a deep breath, don't get too depressed, and but then think about, okay, how can I go through this checklist to try to get as many of these boxes checked? Uh, having said that, you really need to follow your passion. Uh, life is short, so if you feel that the market is looking for this kind of a person, but you're that kind of a person, you don't necessarily have to do what the market is wanting you to do. Find a different market that will uh, find someone like you more attractive. Uh, you have a much better chance of succeeding if you do what you're passionate about, what you like doing. Uh, if you force yourself into doing things just to get a job, you're, more, you're not likely to be happy in the long run. So try to focus on what you like to do and who you are, and I think in the end things will work out for you. Um, okay. Well, Herman, you've obviously been very successful as a researcher. And I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what kinds of things that you think has contributed to this success. And uh, is there any one thing that you would like to change about how you approach your work? I like to have days that last 35 hours or maybe 40 hours. Um, I don't think I have the power to do that. But my father taught me a trick to actually deal with that. He said, take a nap every day. Then he feels like you wake up twice 
every day. It's two mornings. You live twice as long. You have twice as many hours in a day. So I try to listen to my father's advice and try to take a 15, 20 minute power nap every day. So you live twice as long. But uh, as the old saying goes, it's 10% uh, it's inspiration and 90% perspiration. You just have to work hard at what you do, many hours, and be very committed. Uh, the academic career is, is, uh, requires a lot of effort and commitment on your part. It's extremely rewarding. It's the best job in the world. I would not change it for anything. And really, when you do what you love to do, you don't mind working many hours. So I would go back to the previous advice of just follow your passion and do what you really love to do. And then don't tell my dean about this. I hope he's not watching. But I would just do what I do for free because I love what I do. Uh, and that's, I think, the secret to this. Uh, just try to find research areas that you feel passionate about. And then, and then things will fall into place. Um, well, so given uh, the importance of passion, uh, anybody that knows your record would know that you have both a passion and interest in substantive topics as well as research methods topics. And I was wondering if you could tell us as to how you balance uh, those two sets of interests. It's like asking, do you prefer vanilla ice cream or, or chocolate ice cream? Do you love more your father or your mother? Is it substantive research and, and methodological research in my book go hand in hand? You cannot have one without the other. Uh, you improve methods through the substantive research because as you do substantive research you realize you need better tools to do your substantive research better and then you go on and, and develop better methods to deal with your substantive uh, hypotheses and then as you develop better methods now you're able to ask questions about substantive issues that you couldn't do before you created that new method so the balance is I try to do both, and as I work on a substantive project, I try to think about the methodological angle. And when I work on a methodological project, I try to think about the substantive angle. So I think they go hand in hand, and I would not see those as separate domains. Um, as you do substantive work, think about the methods. As you do methods work, think about the substantive domain. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Herman is here uh, visiting Carmen to give a webcast lecture and I thought our audience might be interested in uh, kind of some information about the origin of uh, the, the webcast lecture and its content for what you're going to be giving later on today. I will be talking about meta-analysis. Meta-analysis has uh, now uh, taken on the status of the, of the best tool quantitative tool to summarize the body of research. Uh, the name meta-analysis means beyond the analysis. What you do is you summarize a bunch of studies that have been conducted uh, to try to make sense of a very large body, sometimes inconclusive set of findings. I was fascinated by meta-analysis when I was in grad school. I'm talking about the early 90s. I was fascinated by, by what I thought was a philosopher's stone of researchers, if you're aware of what the Philosopher's Stone is, the alchemists in the Middle Ages were trying to find this magical potion that would turn lead into gold. Uh, it would be a source of uh, immortality and happiness and eternal health. So, in fact, Isaac Newton, the famous physicist and mathematician, spent about 20 years of his life looking for the Philosopher's Stone. The Royal Society did not allow the publication of his papers about alchemy after he died. And it took several, a couple hundred years until those papers were published. So I thought, man, analysis, this is a technique that allows you to put together all these inconclusive, poorly designed studies, lead, and on the other end, you get gold, the state-of-the-art result. This is a true state of affairs. So I was fascinated by the promise of meta-analysis, so I started working on that. In fact, one of my first articles in the early 90s as it was in grad school with, with two friends of mine, also grad students, was in meta-analysis. But then as time went by, I realized that meta-analysis is like any other statistical technique or methodological approach. Uh, you, have to, you have to consider assumptions. Some things are good, some things are not so good, some things need to be improved. So the topic of my talk is 
methodological myths and urban legends about meta-analysis. I will talk about things that people assume to be true about meta-analysis, but may not be so. And I will also try to uh, describe some best practice recommendations in terms of how to do a good quality meta-analysis based on the uh, critical analysis of these methodological and myths and urban legends. Okay. Um, would you uh, give our audience uh, some sense of the other areas that you do research in? I have very broad uh, research interests. Um, if I had to use one label, I would say human capital uh, development and acquisition and deployment. Uh, but really, uh, lately I've been thinking a lot about bridging domains that are artificially separated. One of them is the micro domains within macro domains. How to integrate theories from organizational behavior, human resource management, IO psychology with theories from strategy and even uh, economics. That will be one of the areas I'm working on right now. The other one is bridging science and practice. The Institute for Global Organizational Effectiveness is one such initiative to do that, to bridge uh, the research that academics are doing with the needs of practitioners outside of the academic world. Another uh, bridge that I'm trying to establish is uh, one between qualitative methods and quantitative methods. So my, my research uh, spans these domains and I'm trying to, to build bridges across these domains. Um, an example of that is uh, the work I'm doing now in corporate social responsibility which uh, comes from the strategy field initially. Uh, now I'm trying to uh, bring in some theories from organizational behavior and human resource management to try to understand why and when there will be a positive relationship between uh, social initiatives and financial performance. Okay. Uh, as we wrap up, uh, Herman, uh, I think you and I both uh, uh, have a commitment and a strong interest in developing future generations of methodologists and I was wondering if you would uh, like to provide any final advice to any aspiring methodologists who uh, may end up seeing this recording. Well first congratulations you've made a good choice in terms of watching this webcast or this interview today. Do more, go back to the website, look at the recorded uh, lectures, look at the PowerPoints, look at the readings, and learn as much as you can. Uh, if you're a plumber and there's a new model for a new sink that comes on the market, if you know your tools, you will be able to install that sink. If you're a, research, uh, a researcher and there's a new theory that comes along, uh, if you know your research methodology, you will be able to uh, investigate that theory and test those hypotheses, no matter, no matter what the content of the theory is. So know your tools know your craft and you will be uh, very successful. So the fact that you're involved with karma uh, says uh, that you are already down that path, so congratulations to you. All right, so um, anyhow, as I mentioned, Herman is here to, uh, pre to present his webcast lecture that he was talking about. Uh, so hopefully you'll have the chance to view that. I should have also mentioned amongst Herman's many accomplishments uh, that he is also the, uh, the drummer in the Karma Band. So Herman, uh, thanks so much for uh, coming to Karma and for taking the time uh, to share your thoughts. Thank you, Larry. Yeah.